All right. Welcome everyone. Happy Monday. It is November 6th, 2023. We've just gone back an hour, I believe. It's Eastern Standard Time now from Daylight Savings. We were back to Standard Time. So we are continuing today on the subject of a roadmap for a moral society. What is this roadmap? How do we get there? Why does it exist? Why are we claiming there is one? Well, we believe that the Baha'i teachings provide this roadmap and the writings from Baha'u'llah that is available to everyone that you can read right here, right now, provides that roadmap for our society to get to a golden age. We believe that humanity is at the precipice of not just a renaissance of understanding of its oneness, but a genuine leap beyond our planet to the stars. With that being said, we wish all of you a very beautiful night as we continue going through, but we want to first and foremost, please put your attention on the sessions we've done until now. We've done 40 some sessions and all of these sessions have discussed some pretty important concepts, quotes from the Baha'i writings that discuss various subjects, such as today's subject, which is wisdom in deed and in word. So with that being said, we welcome Mr. Gilbert Hakim as our host, who has been gracious enough to put the time and effort into putting these quotes onto the PowerPoint slides for all of us to reflect on, to consult, to discuss, to question, and to learn from. With that being said, we welcome all of you who are joining us on Zoom, please to unmute yourselves so we can read the quotes. And all of you who are on Facebook and YouTube, please, you're welcome to join on clearwaterbahais.org for the 8 p.m. Monday session. All right. So are we going to get to our next, our first quote? We said our opening prayer already before the recording started. Yeah. Uh, first, I just want to describe the subject. We're talking about wisdom in deed and in word. And I'm going to read the wisdom from dictionary, the quality of having experience, knowledge, and good judgment, the quality of being wise. So that's the definition of wise, wisdom. Now, question is, uh, so relates to how does we, wisdom is applied to deeds and how does the how does wisdom apply to words? And obviously, some of this relates to the uh, talk of uh, or condition of teaching, right? That was the goal of of uh, previous sessions that we we went through. So in that context, now we need to delve into definition of wisdom and application of wisdom in our deeds and words. And how do we come to that? How do we find it? Okay, let's read on. No volunteers? I'll go ahead. <laughs> From His Holiness, Baha'u'llah. O ye loved ones of God, drink your fill from the wellspring of wisdom, and roam ye in the meads, meadows of wisdom, and soar ye in the atmosphere of wisdom, and speak forth with wisdom and eloquence. Thus biddeth you, your Lord the Almighty, the All Knowing. Um, my Persian's bad, but it, that's Lawi Burhan, page 130. Is a Majmu Eye Alvahe Jamala Ardase Abha Lohe Burhan. Burhan means proof. All right, beloved Sorry. ones of God, drink your fill from the wellspring of wisdom. The wellspring, how do we gain wisdom? 
obviously wisdom comes uh, with age and experience of what works and what doesn't. Now, the, que the, the question is that we know about truth. Now, revelation is truth, right? And religion is application of the revelation. We call it religion. Now, the question here is that the first thing that comes with uh, within acceptance of the religion and the truth, the, the first thing relates to belief of that and of the Holy Spirit. So the, the key here is uh, once you believe that, the interpretation, because we don't have any clergy, is for us to learn the Holy Spirit and interpret it for ourselves and gain the knowledge of what it says. So people have a misunderstanding that when I read a particular text, I can translate it to whichever I like the translation. So some Baha'is believe, or some of us believe that our interpretation is as valid as, as someone else's interpretation, which is really not true. Yeah. There is only one meaning for the, the text itself. And it's not something to adjust to our opinion or why, what our likes or dislikes are, because the truth is only one. So what we need to do is strive to migrate toward the truth and recognize when we have conflict or disagreement with the truth. Not to interpret it to what, I, what we like. This is very important. Many, many people believe that believing in majority of Baha'i doctrine makes you a Baha'i. It doesn't work this way. The, the truth is absolute for the period that is revealed. And it's our job basically to have the knowledge and uh, certitude to look at it as the, the solid truth. Now, whether we comply with it or not is a different story. You can have, obviously, not ability or willing or desire to comply with it, but this doesn't deny the fact that it's true. So you need to get to a certain point in your journey of the Holy Spirit that, that recognize where you are in this journey and how you're adjusting yourself to reality and truth. So this is really the key about religion itself. So it's not a, a, a process that you go through life and you say, uh, if I don't know about it, I'm safe. It doesn't work this way either. So you have to have the knowledge. Now, this particular Holy Spirit gives you that knowledge. as the yardstick that you have to live by to achieve the goals of your life. Obviously, the most important process is teaching. And do we need, so two subjects that we're discussing is the wisdom in deeds and wisdom in words. Now, wisdom in words is obviously is used to attract other people to the Baha'i religion and propagate the religion and relieve humanity from the pain that they're in. 
Now, obviously we know the truth. So you say that, uh, you know, consumption of alcohol is forbidden because of uh, the medical impact and influence that it has in physical bodies and the society as a whole and the ills that it can create. So that's the knowledge about that particular subject. Now the question becomes that like, if you go in front of a person that, that uh, adamantly will not give up uh, drinking alcohol and try to press that point, what would be the outcome? Obviously, you're gonna get into disagreement. So the question is that, can you look at the, the truth, the <clears throat> fact from different angles and justify what you do? Obviously not. You can disagree with it or incapable of complying with it, but you cannot deny its existence. And this is the important part. Now, wisdom in deeds. Now you know you have the right. You have to write, uh, you have the right in a certain situation. Now the question is that by exercising your right, you may cause problem for yourself or other people. So what the wisdom says is is not just the word the, of the truth, is the application of the truth that requires wisdom. Sometimes the application, although it's true and you want to exercise it, will cause harm. Whether it's in teaching or, uh, or individual behavior of your deeds, so you have to see the outcome. It may be damaging or not benefiting you personally, although you had the right to, to exercise it. But the outcome would be damaging and the damage would be a lot larger than the benefit you gain from it. So the wisdom says that all, although you have the right, Somebody slaps you, you have the right to take him to court or, or slap him back. But the reality is that the most efficient way is to forgive that person. Try to, to get to the source of the problem. So the wisdom is the use of the power empowered when you're on the right, but you're not exercising your right. So, the, so this is both on deeds as well as words. Now, obviously, let's talk about words. We know that you open up the Bible and most Christians believe that uh, Jesus uh, basically was resurrected and went, his body went to heaven. Obviously, from perspective of the holy text, what was documented is true. Now, application or interpretation of it is what creates division, whether you literally translate that into his physical body was resurrected in three days or his spirit was resurrected and many other definitions. So the holy text, which is authentic, in majority of cases has allegorical uh, language 
that has to be interpreted properly to have a meaning and lasting effect. And Baha'u'llah mentions also that the only true interpreter of the previous revelation is the next manifestation of God. So if you want interpretation of the Old Testament, you have to look at what Jesus said about it. Same thing when Muhammad talks about Christianity, whether during his time he taught and he, he mentioned that Christians now have three gods instead of one. So the question really is, that means that they have gone astray because there is only one God. So these are the key elements that what is the true interpretation of the word of revelation, which is truth. It's with the next manifestation. So similarly, if you look at Iran, for example, better than half of it is reference to interpretation of Quran itself. And he's using those to describe what Quran meant. Mm. So these are the key elements of inter proper interpretation. Now, that's one aspect of it. The other one is how do you deliver it? which is in the words. So if you go and tell, obviously, you know that if you tell an eight-year-old kid that body of Jesus was resurrected, he's, he's gonna start laughing. So we cannot confront people of their faulty interpretation of their own holy text. So that's where the wisdom comes in. How do you get someone that is already believed in Jesus and believe that he's the only savior and is looking at you that you're probably trying to get him astray and you're pointing at misinterpretation of, of Bible, for example, that majority of people believe. So these are the key elements about wisdom and depends on the culture you're coming from. People think that if you know the truth, then you're in the right and you can divulge it in any condition. But obviously that's not gonna work because you're gonna alienate the person. So you see wisdom in words of, although you know, you know the truth, or fallacy of what they believe in, you cannot confront them with the fallacy. And that's where the wisdom comes in. Okay, here it says, uh, O ye loved one of God, bring your fill from the wellspring of wisdom and roam ye in the meads, meadows of wisdom and soar ye in the atmosphere of wisdom, and speak forth with wisdom and eloquence, thus by it you, your Lord. So how can you exercise the Holy Spirit without offending somebody, without causing problems, without causing contention? Um, can I just um, speak sure. about that? I just want to speak about two things. Um, you talked about Christianity and their standards. You talked about, you know, every different people from different cultures, different religions. You know, um, I'm going to just pin down for me personally as a Baha'i um, what I think that wisdom in action is. And I just want to share with you, and I've been trying to do this for some time, because I've had a dichotomy. 
And I've had a, I love, I attend these sessions because they're very challenging for me. It means I have to run to the books immediately after to see with my own eyes because I get quite uh, passionate about it. But one of the two things that really concern me, the most meritorious of all things is teaching, right? This is what we're saying Correct. here. But I would just like to say that in sometimes the holy word of God itself has dichotomies. So I just want to share this with you in terms of wisdom and actions and what the prerequisites are, if you give me two minutes. Of the course. first, okay, so this is um, from the Gleanings, page 289. The first and foremost duty prescribed unto men. Now, this is where I'm coming from when I teach the faith, when I do my actions, whatever. This is where I'm focused. The first and foremost duty prescribed unto men, next to the recognition of him who is the eternal truth, is the duty, not of teaching the faith, of steadfastness in his cause. Cleave thou unto it, and be of them whose minds are firmly fixed and grounded in God. No act, however meritorious, did or can ever compare with it. It is the king of all acts, and to this thy Lord, the all highest, the most powerful, will testify. The virtues and attributes pertaining unto God are all evident and manifest, and have been mentioned and described in all the heavenly books. Among them are, this is about wisdom and action, among them are a trustworthiness, truthfulness, purity of heart in, in regards to while communing with God, forbearance, resignation to whatever the Almighty has decreed, contentment with the things of his, that his will hath provided, patience, nay, thankfulness in the midst of tribulation, and complete reliance in all circumstances upon him. These rank, according to the estimate of God, among the highest and most laudable of all acts. All other acts are and will ever remain secondary and subordinate unto it. And it goes on. And my point being, um, Gilbert, is that when we talk about wisdom and we, you know, and we're talking to somebody about giving up their alcohol or their drugs or their pr um, promiscuity, whatever, the thing that guides us is, is our own, um, you know, you know, our own depth of faith, our own understanding, and our ability to not only be there, but to enable ourselves to become a hollow reed so that we can turn our faces to God in all circumstances through this revelation and ask for help. Um, and of course, with, with practice, you know, practice makes perfect. The more people we involve and engage with, the more people we try to spread this message with, the more we mature. And we do learn wisdom through that process. Just offering that up because, you know, that's where I'm coming from. Well, of course, it's the issue of sin covering eyes. The question is that, that finding faults in other religions or other people, although they may have made a mistake or they have misinterpreted, stressing the reality and truth to them will not have a positive uh, outcome. So the whole key here is we need to regulate our words and deeds to always achieve positive outcome and refrain from creating neg negative outcome. And that's the whole process. Now it's different people have a different, uh, basically uh, venue of expressing themselves. People that are mathematically oriented Generally, it's only black and white. There is nothing in between. But reality is not always black and white. So application, although the truth is the yardstick, we need to judge 
how much, where, and when to de diffuse that reality. And that's exactly. really what's called wisdom. Yeah, exactly. Sure. But if, but if we're not focused, if we ourselves personally do not know where that wisdom is, where it's coming from, then we have no right <laughs> to engage with other people. What, I, what my point is, is that, you know, for us, it's readily available. You know, this roadmap for a model, moral society, this is a wonderful discussion for them. But in reality, we, you know, that we, we just, all of us just need to get the first and foremost duty um, and, and that orientation, because I find myself um, in the hood and I have had to learn different languages, different ways of relating to people and other things. And I've lived all over the world and I've pioneered to the Pacific and other places. And everywhere you go, you have to adapt whatever, you know, uh, in terms of um, being able to share this wonderful revelation, you have to adapt those things. And as a nurse for 40 years on, on the, you know, on the front lines, I've been in situations that most people would never be in. But what my source and my wisdom and my words have come from is turning myself in those moments in time um, to the focus of my adoration, which is the blessed beauty. And we are so fortunate as Baha'is because that's where we can go to. That's our go-to. And um, mature experience, whoever you're talking to, whatever group of people you're talking to, this revelation gives us universality. If we listen to it um, and if we imbibe what it teaches us from the hidden words, from the, the written word itself, it will enable us to practice and put into practice that reality. Yes, the Holy Spirit. And on a human level, the ability to be loving and kind to other people, to take the moment and time to listen to what they have to say. I'm not, as a Baha'i, in the process of trying to um, disavow what other people are saying. I'm trying to catch what they're saying and find what the essence of it and how that correlates to the remedy which all of us have in our first aid kit to be able to say, right, that's a 4A bandage for that and be able to offer that with loving kindness, so to speak. That's just the point that I'm trying to make, you know, in terms of wisdom and utterance and action and deeds. Thank you. Sure. Now, reality is that that's where the wisdom usually comes with age. Now, when you're young, uh, that was a long time ago for me. It was more important for me to prove that I'm right than the outcome of what I was trying to enforce, although I was on the right. Now, God knows that I probably did more damage than good by, by trying to assert myself as a person with the truth. But in reality, you have to measure the outcome, not whether you're right or wrong, or try to emphasize that you're right and try to create collateral to prove that you're wrong, right. So this, these are the key elements that you gain wisdom and avoid conflict. And I'm sure in the uh, next few passages, we will see see all of these suggestions within the holy text itself. But here it's very interesting, which here says wellspring of wisdom. That means that the source of it never ends. It's a spring, it's wellspring. That means that it, as long as you go to, to, to the holy text or holy spirit, you can drink from it. Rome in the Medes, meadows of wisdom. That means that it comes from the, the earth. It covers the earth. You see? Medes of wisdom and soars in the atmosphere of wisdom. That means that it should be applied to the sky, to the land, and to the source that, that comes out of earth. And this is really relates to 
Holy Spirit and application of Holy Spirit, which is religion. So you have to be encompassing and learn from it and learn where and how and when to use it. All right, next one. Say, the exercise of wisdom, verily, is the prince of deeds and the king thereof. Lay thou fast hold upon it, as bidden by him who is the ordainer, the ancient of days. So now we're talking about the exercise. Verily, the prince of deeds. That means that in no condition you would create an environment that creates this divisiveness, and cause harm. So here is a prince of deeds that you make sure you always have a positive outcome. And the kingdom, king thereof. That means that that's, that's the ruler. The potency of your words becomes like a king. If you follow and exercise wisdom, lay that fast hold, hold on to it. So here you have to detach yourself from feeling that you're you're on the right, and you have to exercise your right. So lay that fast hold on to it as bidden by him who is the ordainer, the ancient of days. So now, restraint of the application of being right is linked to the positive outcome. So you see how important th this is. Now, if I punish someone that they deserve it, but they, my punishment is gonna cause harm, I should refrain from do doing it, although it's my right to do so. And this is obviously is different, you don't, refrain from punishing a tyrant because he's going to do it again. As Abdul Baha mentions. So there, there, the application and wisdom now becomes very important. Now, if someone does a mistake, obviously you can refrain from exposing it or using it against them. So these are really key elements, which is very important. Majority of people are brought up in the sense to prove that they're right, even if they're wrong. And they will never accept that they're wrong. So they go to the extent to fabricate realities, even if they themselves know it's not true. And you see this in our society today, especially in the politics. Or news media. This, the same subject comes up and you have few different angles of it which are completely contradictory to one another. Although we know the truth should be one. So the key is that you don't propagate information just for the sake of proving that you're right or proving your point is right. And this is really very difficult to do in this society because society is completely polarized, polarized actually. And people think that they win if they 
create narratives that proves their point. And they have no respect for truth or reality. So what ends up happening is that you have divisive talks, altered realities. You have people that are in constant conflict because neither side is listening to the other. And it said, if it doesn't benefit me, I don't want to know. So you see this issue and how a person should be transparent with their deeds and words and always propagate the truth. So these are the key elements which is completely foreign in our current society, whether it's between family members or workplace or society as a whole, opposite is practiced today. That you enforce your own idea regardless of the consequences of it. And when it happens, you disassociate yourself from the outcome because you had good intentions, but it didn't turn out good. So you see the, where the wisdom comes in, that you have to make sure your deeds and words are not causing harm to yourself and other people. And I'm not sure if we have seen this in the society to, today. Any comment on this side? Sorry, girl, but yes, I do have a comment, of course. Um, you know, much respect to what your what you know your scenario in terms of, but why would you bother to argue with people? You know, there's no point um in arguing with people whatsoever because arguments beget arguments, you know. And in current society, um, I hear the point where you're saying that people try to, you know, win, win. It's all about winning and so on. But fortunately for us, we can be the leaven in that situation and we can, um, you know, not engage in these kinds of um, non kind of like productive scenarios with people. You know, if we can't have a conversation without arguing, then perhaps we should do kind deeds towards those people, you know? Um, we, You know, like personally, listening to what you've just said, um, it, it makes me feel, oh, my God, you know, the whole world is arguing. How on earth do I get about um, showing people love and kindness, trustworthiness and truthfulness? Um, and I'm not going to engage in arguing because I always know where that leads up to. My daughter's a solicitor and I'd never argue with her in a million years because she does it for a job, um, you know, every day. So like argument often is like, um, you know, it's, an, it's, it's, a, it's a waste of time and energy. It doesn't create, you know, good feeling between people. So what, you know, using wisdom, what would you do in that situation? You know, if you didn't want to engage with that um, and you wanted to abide by wisdom, um, you know, so you would not have you would not get into an argument with those people or even um be torn to looking at whatever side, you know, whether that's you know different people with different cultures or people from different socioeconomic um backgrounds and and politics. I mean, we're so lucky. Partisan politics, uh, you know, it isn't in our globe. It doesn't mean we don't know what's going on in the world or in our country. But, you know, we have more, um, better ways to spend our time and our wisdom in, in terms of um, perhaps deeds of kindness, um, actions that are positive if we can't talk to people without, you know, having to engage in an argument. Um, or we could give the proofs of this faith to them. I mean, it just seems to me like, you know, a waste of life, really, and energy to 
to even, you know, get involved um, and the outcome is argument because that's very dissonant to uh, the whole focus for this creation, which is to um, create understanding in some way and, um, you know, uh, continue along so that we can have um, a more unified, um, and so you have to have a pivotal point for people that's over and beyond um, their societal and their socialised um, uh, current condition. So, you know, just a thought anyway, uh, Gilbert, thank you for your patience. Sure. But you have to realise when you're looking at the prior religions due to Renaissance in uh, Abrahamic religion that occurred in the uh, between 13th and 17th century, this separation of church, church and state occurred, and people from their daily lives they separated the social uh, interactions and laws that were designed for managing the society from a, a legal perspective and rights of individual had occurred. Unfortunately, this process hasn't occurred in the Islamic religion. So the key here, and we see the remnants uh, and results of it in atrocities that are occurring in the name of religion, and there are three categories of, of people of all prior manifestations or prior religions, generally. Although the Holy Spirit at the time was true for the period that they were given, application of it in the subsequent revelation would cause harm. And we see the result of it. So you have three classes of people, people that are basically religious just in name, they because they were born Christian or, or Jew or a Muslim and they become Muslim, but they really do not practice it, which is the majority of basically people are in that category uh, in general. And they're, although they're, uh, they believe in social, uh, norms in general, but they follow their own desires or what they think themselves is right or wrong. Then you have a class of people that are religious, but truly believe that the segment of the religion which relates to uh, relates to ethics has to be used in their religion and majority of actions that were performed or the language of contention is for the past. So they live uh, in congruity with the people of other religions in a secular society. And this, as we know, this process didn't occur in the Islamic religion. And the third uh, segment are actually uh, orthodox religious people that truly believe that their text is permanent and is not changeable. Although, as we know in science, everything is relative and it has its own cycle of life and death. But they don't believe that what they believe in of something that was said 1400 years ago can ever be changed. So this, unfortunately, the political system is using this class of people and enslaving them and brainwashing them with their own text because this edict of the Baha'i religion in terms of independent its investigation of truth doesn't exist in their religion. 
or the ecclesiastical system, which is man-made, hasn't been abolished in the religion as it was sanctioned by the latest revelation. So what ends up happening is people are using the text to brainwash their own flock. And this is where the problem arises, that they do not have any tools to defend themselves. And the atrocities that is occurring around the world in the name of religion by these people are that they're enslaved by their uh, religious doctors and political system. And we have to realize and deal with them as people that belong to a cult and not assign it to their religion. The sooner we realize cult nature of these uh, people, the sooner we understand how to deal with them. So materially, you can never persuade them to change. Even if you bring them from the most miserable place on earth and plant them into the most advanced society that benefits them from every aspect of their life, they still keep their ideology of they're the, the person in, in the right and everybody else is going to go to hell. So they, the whole issue, and this is unfortunately last half a century, the Westerners were under this impression that you can change a view of a person by showing them uh, the right way and providing those resources to them to change. But reality, the source of the problem is, is the text that they're interpreting. So the only way to eliminate this problem is to educate and follow the doctrine that was brought in by the latest manifestation of independent investigation of the truth and access to all material that they would search so for themselves. We have a we have a quick question here from Terrence yeah. McBride. He raised his hand. Go yes. Ahead. Um, yeah, I was just making a comment that. Um, well, in an earlier session, you spoke about democracy, how the Baha'is, you know, look at democracy. And my comment is that um, I think it's necessary for the children to be trained such that they are, uh, they uh, exercise critical thinking. And unfortunately, that is something that is not done in today's educational system is the allowance of critical thought and critical thinking. That's the end of my comment. Yeah, of course. But remember, when you're looking at the text, during the war wars that uh, Muhammad uh, basically conducted, he had opponents that were Jews and happened to be Jews. But these were not religious wars. It was uh, basically socioeconomic system that existed at the time. And of course, a group of, of those people that happened to be Jews had conflict with him. And he called them uh, like pigs and dogs. Now, 1400 years later, somebody's reading that book of a skirmish or disagreement that they had with the tribe in Arabia and reading this as all Jews are, are pigs and dogs. Obviously there is a disconnect here and people that are, that are 
being brainwashed with this language that existed in that segment of, of time between tribes that happened to be Jews. So using this in today context, it shows the cultness of the uh, basically orthodox Muslims that are using their religion to propagate their power and enslave people. So this, this issue, uh, and unfortunately last half a century, Western cultures try to enforce democracies into these doctrines and all of them failed. And the reason was because they were propagating relativism. That means that you, you're a Muslim, you're a Jew, you're a Christian, you come to our country, you can practice your religion at home, but leave it at home. When you come out, you have to be complying with the, with the laws of secular society. This is a naive way. And that's why it caused enormous amount of problem with the Western countries. Unless you target and educate them in their belief and the fallacy of their interpretation and application of those laws that had no has no place in the modern society, they would still come out using the resources that are and freedom that is awarded to them or abuse the freedom that they are, is awarded to them and still keep that ancient uh, interpretation of the text with them. So you cannot create a multicultural environment and assuming that, that the person is fully embrace multiculturalism and accept other people as their equal. Great, let's do the closing prayer. Oh my God, oh my God, thou seest me in my lowliness and weakness, occupied with the greatest undertaking. Determined to raise thy word among the masses and to spread thy teachings among thy peoples. How can I succeed unless thou assist me with the breath of the Holy Spirit? Help me to triumph by the host of thy glorious kingdom. And shower upon me thy confirmations, which alone can change a gnat into an eagle, a drop of water into rivers and seas, and an atom into lights and suns. O oh my Lord, Assist me with thy triumphant and effective might, so that my tongue may utter thy praises and attributes among all people, and my soul overflow with the wine of thy love and knowledge. Thou art the omnipotent and the doer of whatsoever thou wouldest. Thank you very much. Hopefully we see everybody. Thank you all. Allah. Allah, have a good evening.